Hi guys, it's Braylon and welcome back to my channel. This video is part of a series for first year special ed teachers and I've gone back and forth about what should be the next part of this series. Last week I know we talked um, about just teaching different rules and different routines and so a big big question that I feel like I get all the time is what do I do about classroom management? So in your interview, I know that they always ask about classroom management and there are so many different schools of thought. There are so many different aspects to controlling behavior and having a smooth classroom. I'm going to go briefly through things that I've already talked about on this channel and I'm going to link them down below because I think if you want to understand classroom management, there are like so many layers to it. I made an entire video about my schedule. I think you should go take a look. I've also made so many videos about timers and about slides. I'm going to link those down below as well. Um, I've also made a video about classroom games for just classroom management. I'm going to link that down below too. So before I even get into this video, I would say do your own research, look at some of those other things um, because I'm not going to be talking about those again in this video. I want to emphasize that a lot of classroom management and special ed is really based in ABA and as someone who went, took my boards, am a board certified behavior analyst. I use a lot of those concepts, but I'm not currently working as a BCBA. I chose in my career whether I wanted to go with that or whether I wanted to focus on being a classroom teacher, and I ultimately chose being a classroom teacher. So I'm not going to go into too many specifics about ABA and just the overall basics. I'm going to link down below also a blog post from other people and videos from other people that have to do with basic ABA methods, although I'm assuming if you're a first year special ed teacher, you've taken at least one class about behavior and ABA type of stuff. I also want to say I'm not going to spend a ton of time uh, talking about token boards and different stuff like that. Um, I would say do your research on token economy, uh, do your research on positive like behavior and reinforcement, stuff like that, that I think a lot of us got in our classes. Um, I will touch on those as we go, but that's not going to be the basis of this video. So. Let's get started. I will say it again, even though I said I wouldn't say it, I'm gonna say it again. Having classroom timers and classroom slides has really, really helped me. Um, I really enjoy starting kids all together and then divvying them up as they go. Um, I think that um, having some sort of reset in the middle is like ideal. Going along with that, um, having some sort of reset activity is huge for my classroom management. So every time we do something, whether it's an academic task or it's some type of activity, I always have kids come back to whatever reset that is. For me, it's either doing like a, a game, like um, a dance on the screen or something like that, um, or it's having sensory activities that they can do at their desk. I've read a lot of research and I've talked to a lot of people about not having a reset activity be super academic. I want to shut that part of the brain off for a second and I want the kids to focus on a task and give that part of their brain a break. Um, having a reset activity be an academic matching to me is not a calm down reset. That's more work. I want it to be a Play-Doh with a toy or, you know, kinetic sand or something like that. I always make sure that there's a timer attached to that, that there's quiet music. Um, I really don't want a ton of talking with the kids during that time. And I don't mind if it's loud necessarily, but I really want to give their brain an actual break. I want it to actually like reset something. I think one of the biggest things for classroom management is having consistent language. So we've talked in many other videos about having clear expectations, having visuals to back up your expectations, but having consistent language is so key. And I feel like I say that in every video, but I've worked in classrooms where me and my staff did not use the same language. The staff refused to believe in the philosophy of how I was viewing behavior and education, and that just made it really challenging. I think that a large amount of behavior stems from one kid thinking they can get away with something with one staff member and then not getting away with it with another staff member and there's just like such contention and, and weird vibes and feelings between the two. Probably the biggest thing is making sure that you don't react. Having staff and really, really like drilling that in all of your staff's heads at the beginning of the year, that when a behavior happens, we don't react. Because like I said at the beginning, if you do your research on a lot of, um, you know, behavior and positive things like that, you need to remember that um, students are looking for some sort of reaction or some sort of attention seeking behavior. This is very much like boiling it down to the basics. I, there's a lot more to be said about this topic, but I want to give you one piece, which is please don't react. 
keep a straight face. It also gives you time to think. Be in control of your body, be in control of your emotions. When a kid is not listening to you and starts to roll on the floor, I wouldn't even start begging them to get up off the floor. I would be very calm, I would pull up my visuals, keep a straight face, and be consistent. That goes into the next one, which is having visuals for things. I don't mean, I wanna make this clear, I don't mean sticking visuals all over the wall that is too stimulating and it's too confusing and you don't know where to look and the kids are not gonna be reinforced by any of that. If anything, you can have a ring of visuals around your neck, you can, you can have a booklet of different visuals. I mean, there are so many things that you can do to keep them near you, but I wouldn't place them all over the wall. As behaviors come up or as the classroom starts to have you know more challenges having behaviors that support that you know what we don't run into the middle of the hallway just because we're angry I'm gonna actually shut my mouth and not say as much but I'm gonna use my visual and I'm gonna say very minimal words about how we're not running we need to go back to class calm tone calm voice visuals to back up what I'm saying I also talked about this in my video about my daily schedule but I do think that having a visual schedule is so key that goes along with the timers because then kids know what to expect some kids really just can't have a visual schedule. Some kids really just can't use token economy because it, they're not there yet. They're not there to process what's happening first and next, but eventually you can get to that point. But having clear visuals about what's happening before and what's happening next is amazing. A lot of times, a lot of general ed stuff I don't like to adopt for my own classroom, but I do think that if your classroom is able to have this, having some sort of noise or light type of like ding noise or some type of bell or something like that, that shows all the kids that they need to reset and um, look at you could be really helpful if you feel like your students are at that point. But I've had classrooms in years where my students were not at a point to even have any type of noise bell, ding, something like that. But I think it just depends on the kids you have. You can feel it out. I would not go and buy a bunch of different bells until you know that they're ready for it. So I do want to touch on providing some sort of incentives. I've talked about this in many other videos, but I provide incentives three times throughout the day because I like that the kids only have to work for like two hour chunks. I have a hard time um, only giving incentives at the end of the day if students can't remember at the beginning of the day what they even did. I've talked about it before. I either give like sticker chart incentives or like I said, do your own token economy research, but sometimes I do use token boards or something like that. Um, and they have to earn a certain amount and then they can have the thing that they want. Um, but I make it very clear about how to achieve that or what you're able to get with what you've earned. I always have tiered incentives. Um, I got a lot of questions about this from my previous videos. I have a, a section where it's like the best things that you can, you can get basically by doing basically everything right. Um, those are like the best and a lot of times I'll have a color associated with that really great thing like a sparkle or something. It's higher up on a shelf, um, we have to reach it for you, um, but you can earn the best thing. Then I have a tier below which is like you probably didn't didn't do as well, you probably didn't fill up whatever chart you're trying to earn at this cash in time, but you did do something and so I really want everybody to have an opportunity to earn something. I don't want any you know, behaviors or meltdowns because I didn't earn anything. Everybody earns something, but having that middle tier is like, those are probably not as good of an activity that you want to do, but they're, you still earn something. They're not the best, but you still earn something. And then I have the lowest shelf, which is you barely did anything, you barely made it, you, you kind of tanked, but again, I don't want to melt down because you didn't earn anything, but here are your options. And that is usually incentive enough for kids to realize that, oh, I never want to be at this lower tier because my options are like read aloud books and, and like mazes. You know, I don't want that. I want like the iPad. I want the, you know, the fun games and all that stuff. Having relationships with your students is key. And I know in special ed, it's like weird because you're like, well, there's a lot of staff. You don't want anyone to have like their, you know, their primary staff member that they like the most or their preferred person. I totally get that. But I want to add that even a student who's nonverbal can sense when you're really caring about them, when you're really investing in them and building a relationship with them is so key. Also, I think it depends on the classroom where some kids might be in inclusion, in and out all the time or things like that. But building some sort of classroom culture is ideal. Having times when you're all together, when each staff member is looking into the kids' eyes and complimenting them, when you're really giving positive reinforcements, I think that's so amazing. When you're taking time to do something something fun, when you're asking them questions, when you're, you're coloring with them. I used to 
take a lot of my prep time and the kids would be doing like downtime activities and I would like to sit with them and color with them, you know, or sit next to them and do a puzzle with them. Not because it was like trying to get at a goal, but because I really wanted them to see that I was with them, that I cared about them and that I was building relationships with them. I think you'll get much farther if you're investing in stuff like that now. Also, I would say invest in relationships with your staff, whether that's the other teachers or the paraprofessionals, not in a fake way. Like don't just like make them cookies and call it a day, but like ask them about how they're doing, like sit with them, laugh with them, um, drink your coffee in the morning with them. That goes so much farther. I've worked in classrooms where, you know, all my staff were close. We're not best friends. We're not gonna hang out all the time. I mean, that's excessive, but, we drink our coffee in the morning together, we laugh, we have a ton of fun. I always tell them I will back you up 100%, I have your back, stuff like that. And you might think, what does that have to do with classroom management? But that has everything to do with classroom management. I had a couple classrooms in one of the jobs that I had previously, and all of the paraprofessionals hated the teacher. The teacher was so rude to them, she never treated them with respect, they hated her, they never wanted to help her, and the teacher wanted to just control everything and do all of the work. Kids are going to feel that when you're a control freak and when you hit your staff. The staff is going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to push that discomfort onto the kids and um, the room is not going to feel like an inviting place and we want the room to feel super inviting and super warm. I've had a couple conversations with special ed teachers where they've asked me, okay, what about whole group versus centers versus independent workstations? And all of those are tricky and I think it really depends on the teacher. I think it depends on the kids that you have in the room and what you're most comfortable with. I have found in the past that if I'm teaching a whole group lesson, I have the ability to get engagement from different kids and do different differentiation type of things, but those are definitely subjects and times that don't have IEP goals attached to them because when you have an IEP goal, you really have to be focusing on that goal. I also prefer to do centers because I love getting to be with one or two kids at a time, um, working on something really specifically and really watching them learn. I've talked about this in previous videos, but I take a lot of time to plan out my whole week. I take time with centers to plan what they're gonna do. I also have slides that delegate the kids to different groups and we make sure that we're following through on that and that the kid is going to the small group table with their correct staff member and they're doing their work. I wanna say that having a clear cut like where kids are going during what time is gonna eliminate a lot of that stress. Also having kids in small groups is gonna help with your classroom management because one staff is only working with two kids. They can focus on their behavior, they can focus on their emotions, and they can really start to work with those kids you know, more exclusively. If you do choose to have some sort of whole group time and you are in a special ed room and you have staff, I would recommend that you ask your staff to be there for those whole group times. And as you're teaching the kids, and maybe you can like, orient them like I used to have the kids be in like a U shape if there were too many kids to be at one table they would have their own individual tables or their own individual chairs but they would be like in a U around me and I would have my staff strategically sit behind different groups of kids or if I didn't have enough staff for that they would be walking and pacing behind the kids whispering in their ear moving on to the next one pointing to the visual that they need moving on to the next one back and forth and back and forth and it seems like excessive and like a lot of work but if I'm teaching the whole group then the staff behind them can be giving them positive praise they can be rewarding them with things they can be supporting them if they need help um, and that is all necessary to again minimize the behaviors that are happening I really want to touch briefly on punishment and what to do with big behaviors every school is different when it comes to classroom management when it comes to like stuff like this if a kid is super aggressive I would suggest you ask your school before you even start, what is their protocol with that? Do they send kids to the principal? Personally, I don't think kids should ever go to the principal because I think that's more of a reward versus a punishment. That's the T on that, but you do your own research on that. Um, is there a place where a kid can go to calm down? Is there a way to remove the kid from the classroom versus removing all of the other kids from the classroom? I would recommend having bins and activities already prepared. So if you ever have to evacuate a kid out of the classroom, all you have to do is go pick up those bins, send them along with the kid to wherever they're going, and they have something to do fun, something engaging, something at their level right away. 
I would also make a contingency plan and talk to the kids at the beginning that if they were to ever have to be evacuated out of the classroom or they would earn double incentives or they would get to do their cash in time early. Ask about how you're getting restraint trained and whether or not that school even really supports kids getting restrained. Those are key, key things that go into behavior management because how else are you gonna handle it when a kid is super aggressive? One thing that I like to build into my classroom is a calm down area. It's not an area with fun games. It's a calm, quiet area where kids can go if they're feeling overly stimulated or they're super angry. It's definitely not for aggressive kids, but it's for kids when they just need to shut things off. That was a lot. That was a lot of little things sprinkled throughout, but I really am passionate about this topic. I think there are so many ways to keep a classroom calm and managed and engaged. And I think there's a way to succeed at all of it. And is it gonna be easy? No. And if you're a first year teacher, are you gonna have moments where everything's gonna like start flying in your face? Yes, I wanna make sure you don't expect this to be perfect. You expect to get hit in the face prepare for that. You expect to have lessons fail, please prepare for that. And you're gonna expect to have a lot of kids misbehaving. Please prepare for that. Nothing is perfect. And I wanna give you the honest, honest, honest views. With all that said, you're amazing. I'm so glad we get to keep making these videos and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.